Matthew 14, 22. And it reads, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the winds were contrary. Now on the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, Is this a ghost? And they cried out of fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. <clears throat> Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to Jesus, to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, truly, this is the Son of God. Right before you take your seats, if you would, get some backbone, look three people squarely in the eye and tell them, no risk, no reward. Tell them, no risk. Like most of you in the room, for much of my life, <clears throat> I've played it safe. I guess I'm the only one. <laughs> well, I'm grateful to be in a room full of people believing for the impossible and taking faith steps, believing God for miracles, uh, I'll state this again because some things bear repeating, even if you have no witnesses. For much of my life, <coughs> I played it safe. Uh, thank you, I got one. Is, is there another? Is there another? Can I get two, 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 three? Thank you, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, thank you. I didn't give the answer <clears throat> in class that I knew for fear that a chance there's a chance I may be wrong. Thank you. I got four claps. Got <laughs> I took my eighth choice or ask my eighth choice to the dance. <laughs> I never got around to asking my first choice to the dance for fear that I may be rejected. Some of you out there have a beautiful voice that no one will ever hear because you refuse to stand before a crowd. And so only you and your shower <laughs> will hear the angelic melodies that proceed from your mouth. There are those, some of you in this place that, that have not and will not say yes to ministry because there's a chance that after you step up, you may mess up. And so there's a fear to even say yes to, to ministry because of the possibility of imperfection.
Well, I'm still trying to find the perfect vessel, biblically. We're paralyzed in fear because of the possibilities. There are some of you here that still have not applied for the position that you really want. Because you may not be picked up. So we live in a place, for many of us, of, of safety. Like the servant who took their talents and buried their talents because they needed to stay in a place of safety. And isn't it interesting that, that Jesus, when he gives this indictment of the parable of the talents, there are two of the three that go and double the money. But the one that buries the money, he doesn't say frugal. He does not call him cautious, but he calls him wicked and lazy slave. Now, there's a whole lot of things in the Bible that we call wicked. But when's the last time that you called someone wicked who had a gift they did not step out on? Or took some of the potential that God gave them and shelved it waiting for perfect conditions? I know there are categories of, of, of wickedness, there are categories of sin that we deal with. We deal with categories, and there are only a few, right? We, we deal with substance, we deal with sexuality, we deal with the same categories of sin. But I want to expand some of these categories just a little bit. There are categories that are beyond the ones that most people harp on, on a regular basis, and one of the categories is shelving your ability or living beneath the possibilities in God. Came for some folks who, who have been playing it safe. For some folks that <coughs> have been comfortable living in a place of safety, fearful, of risk. This passage paints the picture of what happens, what takes place after Jesus <laughs> feeds the 5,000. They, he sends the rest of the disciples over ahead of him as he goes up and begins to pray to broker things with God. I don't believe that he was simply praying because of what he was about to do, this supernatural feat walking on water, but I believe he was praying to give the disciples a little bit of time to move forward. There he is, praying. He says, guys, listen, I'm going to catch up. Go up a little bit ahead of me. Get in the boat. I'm going to meet you on the other side. But Jesus, how are you going to get there? Don't worry about how I'm going to get there. I have means of getting to where I need to go. You guys go get in this vessel. You go get in the boat and get ahead of me. I'm going to go pray, but I'm going to meet you in a little bit. Now, what's interesting is Jesus sends them ahead of them. him, does not get on the boat knowing that there was going to be a storm. All right, they're asleep on this side. Let me see if I have some, <laughs> some AP students on this side who... Because the assumption is that if I walk with God, my, my walk should be secure, it should be stable, it should be comfortable. But I wish I had time to talk about the unorthodox Jesus, the Jesus that does not fit neatly into your expectation box. The Jesus that allows you to witness miracles in his presence. But then, after the miracle, he doesn't tell you often the purpose of the miracle. Sometimes the miracle is to marvel. But in other times, the miracle today is to, be believed, to build a fresh sense of the possibilities for tomorrow. Sometimes the miracle is to bow down and worship him. But then other times, the miracle is for you to witness what he does so that there is empowerment for what you're expecting him to do in the middle of life's storms. I know we celebrate when God does something supernatural in our midst, but in maturity, I've learned to temper my celebration a little bit. I'm a little cautious. 
When God starts working miracles in my life, when he starts opening doors, when he starts blessing, when he does things that just cause my jaws to drop and marvel at him, I start getting, I praise God with one hand. But there's another side of me, like that, that, that curious emoji, you know what I'm talking about, that, that thinking emoji. There's another side of me that is waiting for what's next. It doesn't take away my celebration. I get my good shout in. Are you with me? I get my good celebration in for all the things that God does because we need to celebrate what God does. But when God does miracles, sometimes I'm a little, I'm a little bit prepared for, for there to be a shift in dynamics. It doesn't happen every time, but sometimes the miracle is for me to marvel and celebrate. To reveal, It reveals God's faithfulness. But other times, the high point or the miracle is to sustain me for the valley that is coming. <clears throat> yeah, when you walk with him, you'll learn that there is this ebb and flow of valleys and mountains, mountains and valleys. I've heard it said that we go from strength to strength, glory to glory, and that is not the picture progressively of stair steps going higher as if you go higher every day with Jesus. It is the greater, the greater picture is of mountaintops with valleys that follow and mountaintops after the valleys you just came out of. So here's the picture. We go from strength mountaintop to valley strength mountaintop. We go from glory mountaintop to valley to glory. So God sometimes will upset equilibrium if you don't know what's going on. He'll take you from a mountaintop experience to a valley. He will take you from watching the miracle of 5,000 being fed with a boy's lunch, not just so that you'll marvel and praise God, but so that you'll remember what God just did today for the storm that you're getting ready to go into tomorrow because sometimes Jesus makes his presence known right there with you other times he'll send you ahead of him to see if you remembered what it was like when his presence was rich and you were able to discern it he I don't talk to somebody who feels as if God has left them. You feel as if Jesus is not talking to you like he used to. You feel as if there are no fresh miracles. Well, God wants you to remember the miracles of yesterday to get through today's storm because there is a lesson in it. He, he sends them ahead into a storm. Sometimes he sends you into a blessing. Sometimes he sends you into abundance. Sometimes he sends you into promotion. But sometimes he leaves you in that predicament, not with a promotion, but with a demotion. Sometimes, God, I wish I had time to work this like I wanted to. If I had time, I'll work this like a chicken wing until there was no more meat left on the bone. I'll crack the bone open and suck the marrow out of this. But you got to get to brunch, so let me go on. Sometimes God will send you into a God-induced storm to get out of you what you have allowed to lay dormant. Because God's job is not to make you comfortable. God's job is to get glory out of you. And I know in the Western church, we've made it about your creature comforts, but I came to disrupt your creature comforts. I came to bring a sword today. Are you still here with me? I didn't come to make you comfortable. I came to upset your comfort. I came to disrupt your pattern. I came to get you out of your cycle, your perpetual cycle of a cute little service and a cute little life. God didn't save you for a cute little life, but Baby, God saved you for him to be glorified. Touch somebody and tell them, if to get glory, there must be some storm. I'm cool with a storm. I don't like going through storms. But if I know this was your intention, then I'm okay with it. I, if I know there's a lesson in it, I'm okay with it. If I know that it's redemptive, I'm okay with it. If I know that this was part of your divine scheme, I'm okay with it. He sends his disciples into 
a storm. And this is where we wonder about how, if God is cruel or not when he allows us to experience a storm. This is where we wonder if God is real or not when he allows us to experience a storm. This is when we, for some of us, backslide, when God allows there to be a storm. It, it, when it seems, in a storm, it seems as if the wicked are prospering and the righteous are suffering. It's in the storm. The question goodness of God. But interestingly, I love the time of this text. I hope I get through this. The time of the text, the writer is very careful to make sure that he gives us the time of the text because nestled in the time of the text is a blues clue for what God is about to do. I didn't mean to rhyme that. That was... <laughs> but nestled in, in the time is a revelation and foreshadowing for what God is about to do and what God does in the storm. Um, it was in, say, the fourth watch. Okay, thank you, ma'am. I appreciate it. Everybody else? <laughs> it was in, listen, the fourth watch of the night. Since their, uh, their, their conquest, since the conquest of Pompeius, the Jews developed the Roman system of time into four watches. The Bible says that this was the fourth night or the fourth watch of the night. Say four watches. Four. Yeah, thank you. Fourth watch of the night. Accordingly, this was between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. in, listen to me, the dimness of the early dawn. This was 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. It was in, not the morning, not, not the bright side of the morning. It was not noonday. We don't know exactly what part of the fourth watch this was, but it was in the dimness of the early dawn. It was, it marks a transition. It was, it was in a dark moment, but a dark moment that was not designed to stay dark. It was in the God sometimes does God's best work in the fourth watch. God, it's not always when I can see my way. It's not always when, when the radiance of the sun is, is felt on my skin. Uh, I know this is metaphor, but there, there is a revelation nestled in this. God does God's best work. Sometimes when it's darkest, when you cannot see your way, when you're trying to figure out what's next, it is not always when there's clear authority and the strength of divine revelation. But sometimes God does his best work while you're trying to figure out what you're doing, God, if you're doing, God. Have you forgotten about me, God? I can't see what's next, God. I've built something up to this place, but I don't know where I'm going tomorrow. I have people following me, and I don't know. I have kids looking at me and I don't know. I have family asking me questions I can't even answer. Because of my success in years past, there are people looking for answers today. And if truth be told, I don't even have the answers. I don't feel God you're speaking like you used to speak. I don't hear you like I used to hear you. I don't have the fresh faith I used to have. But I came to declare to somebody who finds themselves right there that God gives God's best answers at the fourth watch in the dim seasons of our life when we cannot always discern or see what God is up to. I came to declare to someone who feels as if you're in the dark, this is not a general dark, this is a fourth watch dark, which means it's only dark for now. 
and it's a matter of time before God does something because it's in the fourth watch that there is transition from darkness to light from night to morning and I came to declare to somebody who's been fumbling and stumbling around in the dark fret not weeping may endure for a night but I hear the Lord saying if you haven't been in the dark this is not for you but I need some people that have been asking when God how God what you gonna do God have you forgotten about me God I didn't come for everybody else I came for you and the Lord says I'm making my way to you so somebody tell him he may be delayed in the storm, but he's making his way. He may not have been here when I was in my fear, or I may not have been able to discern him, but he is making his way to me. Grab somebody by the hand, tell him you can't see it yet, but the Messiah has stepped on the thing that is shaking you. You haven't made it yet. You haven't seen him yet. You haven't heard him yet. But he heard your cry. He's seen how you've been tossed around. He's seen how you've been stumbling around the dark. And he sent me in this place to declare. He's making his way to your boat. He's making his way to your dilemma. He's making his way to your darkness. And when he gets there, everything's going to be turned around. That's not the message. But I needed to give that to someone who's getting ready to walk out because you feel like God's forgotten about you. I don't have time to go through all this, but would you testify to three people around you? Touch them real quick. Tell them he's on the way. He's on the way. I know the wind's still blowing, but he's on the way. I know they're still lying on you, but he's on the way. I know you don't know how you're going to pay your mortgage or your rent this month, but he's sent me in here to declare to you he's on the way. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. Don't walk out until I get through this. I just need to put a placeholder there to remind someone who's in frustration that he heard your cry and he's on He starts walking. He starts walking. He's walking. Tell somebody, tell him he's walking. He's walking. He's walking. He's walking. He's walking. It is in the dimness. Fourth watch of the early dawn. It is the idea of the transition from darkness into light. It's, it's dark, but it's getting ready to turn around. It's dim, but it's getting ready to turn around. You can't see your way, but it's getting ready to turn around. In the fourth watch, he allows them to be in a God-induced storm. Uh, yeah, the enemy can't get credit for this one. And even if it is the enemy raging, I don't need to rebuke the devil on this one because you cannot rebuke the devil when God allowed the storm. But here's the good news. Whenever God allows a storm, it is to produce glory in you or to produce something that you would have not otherwise obtained. I don't know who I'm talking to. But you've been crying in your storm. God sent me to declare you can rejoice in your storm when you know that this storm is going to bring something out of me. This storm is going to produce some glory. This storm is going to give me a testimony. This storm is going to prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. 
this storm is going to give me a fresh hallelujah to the Lord. This storm is going to change my praise. This storm is going to prove the faithfulness of God. This storm is going to give me double for my trouble. This storm, where it was light and momentary suffering that will produce an eternal glory, this storm is going to make me look more like Jesus. Touch somebody, tell them, by the time I finish with this one, I'm going to praise God for this storm. I That's why David said, it was good for me that I was afflicted because if I wasn't afflicted, I wouldn't have learned your ways like this. But after I came out of this storm, I looked like Jesus. I praise God for a new car. I praise God for a new house. I praise God for new clothes. But I don't care about none of that stuff. I want to come out of my storm looking like Jesus. That's what I want. Tell somebody this storm is going to have me brand new. He, he, woo, he comes out. And here's what I love about Jesus. It's a reminder to you, the thing that's tossing them. This is why we worship. Because when we worship, even though we're still weak, we're reminded of the God who is strong. Even though we are limited in time and space, we are reminded of the God who is omnipresent. Even though we are limited in our ability, we are reminded of the God who has all power and is omnipotent. That's why I love worship. Because when I worship, I'm reminded of who God is. And if I could ever understand who God is and the authority God has, if I under, ever understand that that God loves me, then I realize he will never allow the storm to take me out because the thing that is tossing me I wondered why this time Jesus was not on the boat in the storm because sometimes he needs to remind us visually of what we cannot grasp experientially so while they're being tossed and feeling like they're going to die this situation is what will kill them here comes Jesus as a reminder he is crazy walking on top of the thing that is tossing them. I think that's why he waited. God, I feel like preaching. I think that's why he waited. The Bible says when Lazarus died, he didn't come right away, but he took his time. He said, Lazarus is dead. And it's good for you. How is his death good for me? And how is it good that you took your time? Because when I take my time, it allows for this trial to get real ugly. It allows for the darkness to get real dark. It allows for the panic to become really pronounced. But I just want to remind you that the thing that is tossing you has no authority authority over me he could have from the boat or from the shore just stood out and said peace be still but this time he didn't want to use his voice to calm the winds and the waves he wanted to do it with his feet why did he want to do it with his feet? Just to remind them that even though it's tossing you, I'm making my way to you. And what is tossing you is been under my feet. The Bible talks a lot about feet. When it's under your feet, it's saying it cannot overcome you. When it's under your feet, it's under your authority. When it's under your feet, it is no longer a threat. When it's under your feet, when they would go into battle and just to show that the enemy was defeated visually before everyone the conquering king would take the other king that was opposing them and put 
their neck under their foot just to let them you know he ain't getting back up this thing is not going to kill you I know that when we're getting ready to go into the battle you were worried about your livelihood you were worried about your safety but I came to announce to you that the battle is over why? because it is under my foot tell somebody what's tossing you around God wants to remind you that it is under your foot or it's under his foot and if it's under his foot then it can't kill you if it is under his foot it means it will only be out of control for so long before he brings it back to subjection if it is under his foot then you have the victory even before he gets into the boat he comes God I gotta go we gotta go he comes walking to him declaring it's under my foot he leads them Joshua into a storm that is a God induced storm that is tossing them. He delays his approach. He walks on the thing that is tossing them. But there's another revelation here, and this is the message that I may not get to today. Because y'all were shouting amen. But he does not walk on the water to get into the boat. He walks close enough to the boat and stops. There's a revelation in everything. He stops. Why does he stop? I'm going to have to go home here, but you got to promise you come next week. Because right now you're still trying to figure out what this message has to do with that song. How did I ever forget? How did I ever lose faith? How, how did I ever, how did I subtly lose the sense of the impossible? <laughs> you can marvel at what Jesus does and still lose fresh faith for the impossible in your life. If Jesus' goal was to get worship by showing that what was tossing them was under his feet, he would have just spoke to the winds and the waves and caused them to be still, jumped on the boat and received the worship, but he was not looking simply for worship. He was looking to see if anyone got the revelation. He, he walks on the water. He, he comes in, in bold, triumphant fashion. He, he walks on the thing that is tossing them to remind them that everything tossing you is under my feet. Every struggle, every challenge, every sickness, every pain, every need, every adversary, every dilemma, every heaviness is, is under, it's under my feet. but he doesn't get on the boat. He could have proved that by walking across the water and jumping on the boat, but he doesn't get on the boat. He stops. He stops close enough 
for them to see and to hear him. He stops. The men on the boat are terrified. They said, it's, it's a ghost. And Peter said, I don't know. I like Peter. Peter got into trouble. We'll talk about this next week. Don't you miss this week, I promise you. <laughs> Peter says, like Peter, because Peter will take a risk, even a stupid risk. <laughs> the Bible says, Jesus said, it's come as I. Peter said, I, I, I don't know about that. How you know? Because he said, if it's you. Next week, we're going to talk about what real risk is. Because there's never, ever perfect faith. There's always a, yeah, but what if? He said, if it's you. Question is, why does Jesus come and walking on the waves? And why does he stop? It wasn't just to show he had authority. It was not simply to show <coughs> for, for him to be worshipped. But he stops, hoping that somebody gets the revelation. He says, I know that I can do the impossible. And I know that you've seen me do the impossible. But here's the hardest thing that you'll ever deal with in a storm and in your journey with Jesus is believing that he will do the impossible with you and for you. So Jesus takes a divine pause. Peter catches the cue that you haven't called us from our businesses. You didn't call us from our previous lifestyle, you didn't call us to follow you in the realm of what was possible without you. It'll come. Just think about it. We, you did not call us to walk with you only to accomplish what could be accomplished by people who don't know you. I'm not sitting up here in church every week and in my word every week and praying to you every week and lifting my hands to you simply to leave here and do what people who don't know you do every day. I don't walk with the God of the universe and refuse to take risk at his word that people who don't know him are taking risks for. You know what? I've seen you multiply food. I've seen you open blind eyes. I've seen you raise the dead. I've seen you spit in the dirt. 
put it in a man's eye. Tell him to go wash. I've seen you take a party that was dead and create new wine. I've, I've seen you time and again move in authority. But I didn't follow you to watch all that and not have enough faith to believe that you would do it for me. That you would somehow at some point in my life take what is under your feet and show me that it can be under my feet too if I keep my eyes on you. I don't know who I'm talking to but I came for some people that have been playing it safe. I came for some people that are refused to start a business because you heard no for the loan. I came to talk to some people who are ref refused to go to school because nobody in your family went. To there are people that don't believe who do that. I need some people that came to believe the impossible, that what Jesus has under his feet he desires to be under your feet. I came to bring back the sense of possibilities. Possibilities of what? I'm not crazy because I've seen it in my life, but I'm ready to see more. I came to, to give you a sense of the possibilities, possibilities of what? The possibilities of miracles. Possibilities of big prayers being answered. The possibility of abundance when you can see nothing but lack. The possibility of God using your messed up life in the things that you thought disqualified you for God and from people, God taking that and using it to impact your generation. I came into this place believing for miracles. 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 He healed your grandmother and he can do something with your diagnosis. He extended their life. He can do something with your prognosis. He opened up doors. There are doors God opened up for family members of mine that were documented from slavery. I have trouble believing God for some of the things my slave ancestors believe God for. God says it's time to expand. It's time to believe. God sometimes will create a storm and a deficit. He says, I've caused you to hunger and thirst so that I may feed you with manna. When it's a God-induced storm, it's to set you up for a God-sized solution. And God has orchestrated your steps into this house to cause you once again to believe in the sense of the impossible. I don't want to groove, y'all. I want to go back to what we were playing. Come on, y'all. Come back. I want to minister what we did when we were finished, when we started. Let's stand together. Lift your hands. Lift your hands. In fact, don't lift your hands. If you're here and that's you, if you feel like life has, um, it has suppressed your belief. You started your walk with God believing all things are possible, but after a couple prayers weren't answered, you started to play it safe. You started to look at the winds, you started to look at the waves, the circumstances, the, the court case that you're in, the, seems like your back's up against the wall. They have more against you than there is for you. Here. 
the, the, the loss of resonance for somebody with your kids. It feels like you'll never, ever have the relationship with them that you, you once desired. You started with fresh faith, but the world has pushed that faith to the periphery. Circumstances have, have limited your sense of the possibilities. I want to pray a prayer with you. I want to pray a prayer until next week when we really unpack this. But a prayer of faith. A prayer that God restores and renews your faith. And here's all I'm praying for. I understand that there are things in our lives and everything's a miracle. It's a miracle. I understand that you got up this morning. It's a miracle that you have clothes on your back. I understand that. It's a miracle that you have something to eat. We're grateful for that. We, we pray. We say our grace. We thank God for provision. But here's, here's what I'm speaking to. I want to stir fresh faith and belief that God will do what you've concluded is beyond you. Listen to me. Beyond your resource, beyond your social circle or connections, Beyond what the doctor is able to do, I need some people who are believing God for what is beyond them. Meet me at this altar real quick. I want to pray with you. Yeah, you don't have to think about it. If it's you, just come. If not you, don't worry about it. I want you to meet me here. I want you to meet me here. As you come, come open to the sense of the possibilities. As you come, Come with hearts tuned toward God. Some of you may be coming with, like Peter, you may be coming with an if it is you. What, what is the it, if it is you? I love God, and he says this. He says this, listen. He says to the man's son who was plagued by a demon, he says to him, he says, do you have faith? The man said, your disciples tried to cast this thing out. They could do nothing with it. And we've taken him from place to place, and no one, no one could do anything about this dilemma. That's the kind of, that's the kind of prayer I want to pray today. And here's what Jesus says to him. He says, do you believe? That's what I ask you. Do you believe? Do you believe I'm still able to do this? Now listen, here's what I need you to understand. God does not need a perfect response to that question to do what God's getting ready to do. He can take an honest response. Because the man said, Master, I believe. there's a part of me that's gone through too much that is not willing or not desiring to endure another disappointment. So listen to his words. He said, I believe, but help my unbelief. And I know some people have taught you that you must have perfect faith, or if it didn't happen, there's something that you, you didn't believe enough, but listen to what the man says. He says, I believe, but there's a part of me that's been so disappointed that, that I need help with this part of me that doesn't believe, this part of me that's hurt, this part of me that doesn't feel like I'm ever going to get justice for this, this part of me that doesn't feel like anything will ever change, this part of me that believes that I hear another no, I've heard too many no's, this part of me that believes that I'll, I'll cry out to you and you won't do anything about it, he says, I believe, but, 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 but I need you to help me with this part of my unbelief. And what I love about Jesus is he does not rebuke the man in his authenticity, but he receives him. And he does the miracle 
that the man was standing in need of. And here's my prayer. Because there are a lot of church services. And God, thank God for, for every single one of them. But as they were singing about this song that we were lifting our, our hands up to, when they, were, when they were singing about God being more than able, when they were singing about losing the faith for the impossible, I, I felt something well up in me. I said, this is not just a message, but God needs a demonstration. Because what builds fresh faith is not a singing forever about what never happens. Are singing forever about what we never believe God to do. What creates fresh, fresh faith is giving God the opportunity. And I heard him say today, just, it's me. Come on out. Come out of that boat. Risk it again. Try it. I know this storm at the fourth watch. I know the darkness that you've been in. I know you not being able to see your way has brought about discouragement. But I wonder, is there enough faith in there? Doesn't have to be perfect faith, but is there enough faith in there for you to keep your eyes on me and to put one foot outside of that boat. What's the foot outside the boat? Trying one more time. Believing one more time. Not having certainty. Still with an if it's you. But I believe with strong conviction that this is you. And I believe this time if I step out, you are not going to let me sink. Because ultimately this is not for my name. It's not for my glory. Because when I walk over to you, when I take this this risk, I promise you, I'm going to give you the glory for this. I promise you, I'm going to let everybody know what the Lord has done and how marvelous it is in my eyes. Is there anybody? If that's you, just, just lift your hands. How did I ever forget? How did I ever forget? How did I ever forget, guys? Let it minister, come on. You believe it even through the pain and through the darkness. Lift up your voice and make it your declaration. You all. do it for you. Lift your hands. Lift your hands. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you. I thank you, God. I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. Fresh faith, God. Fresh faith. Fresh faith. Fresh faith. Fresh faith. Fresh faith. Fresh faith. Lord, I pray that you break discouragement, that you break doubt. You have not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love. God, a sound mind. I thank you for us believing and stepping out on what is beyond us. What is beyond us, Lord. Give us a sense of the possibilities in you. Lord, take away the desire to play it safe. Lord, I pray that you be glorified through us. That you be glorified in us, God. In the name of Jesus, Lord. I thank you. I glorify you for what you're doing. Renew minds. 
fresh vision, acceleration, all the component parts we need, Father. In the name of Jesus, Lord. God, I thank you. God, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. God, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you for holding us up. I hear the Lord saying, this time, this time, your fear is that you would sink. This time you won't sink. This time he's going to hold you up. This time he's going to give you results that you weren't even believing for. This time he's going to exceed expectation. It's going to happen. Yeah. The manifestation of more than you imagine. And anchoring. Coming back to your first love. Believing that all things are possible. That God's not finished with you yet. The call of ministry on your life is not done. It's dormant, but not void. I hear the Lord saying it's dormant, but not void. And you've been looking to feel it before you believed him and stepped out. God says if you step out, you won't have to feel it, but you'll see it. You'll see me do more through you than you ever imagined. You'll see yourself again speaking in power and authority. You'll see the heaviness begin to break. Don't wait for it to break to run. Run. I got a picture of you running. And as you run with chains, it's like shackles on your feet. As you run, there's greater strength and the chains are falling off as you run. Not before you run, as you run. You felt limited because of them. And that's why you haven't been in the race in the way that he's called you. But as you run, the chains will break. Father, thank you. I thank you for accelerating your pace. I thank you for chains that have bound him to be broken. In the name of Jesus, I thank you. Lord, I thank you. Fresh faith, fresh faith, fresh faith, fresh faith, Lord. Would you do it for every one of your children here present? Would you do it for every one of your children here present? Lift your hands. Father, I thank you. I thank you for the empowerment of your spirit. I thank you for authority being restored. I thank you for obedience. Listen to me. Hear me, please. God is going to start speaking to you. As they were on the storm, there was a void of the clear and present voice of the Messiah. But before they do anything, he starts speaking to them again. Put your hands on your ears. He speaks in our spirit, but it's symbolic. I want you to put your hands on your ears. Heavenly Father, would you speak? Hallelujah. Yeah, yeah. It's not the money that you need at this moment. It's a word. It's a word. It's a word. Speak again. Yeah, speak again. When we open up our Bible, speak to our spirits. When we walk with you in prayer, speak to us. Lord, even unprovoked, unsolicited, speak again. I pray that there's a flow of communication, a, a flow of divine revelation. Because if you're not calling for the faith step, it's just our ambition. And we're not led by our ambition. We're led by your word. We're led by your desires. We're led like your servant Jesus who says, I only do what I see my Father do in heaven. So, Lord, would you speak? Speak in the darkness. Speak in the storm. Speak in the dilemma. Speak in the confusion. 
speak in the void speak in the fear speak in the doubt speak to your servants once again and show us where it is you're bidding us to come hallelujah 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 yeah yeah for Peter it was water but for you it's not water for you it's believing him to do what is beyond you so God speak and as you speak I pray for instantaneous obedience I pray for instantaneous obedience I pray that the grass would not grow underneath our feet but I pray as we discern your will we heed your voice and we follow you speak and give us the faith to respond as that is our job it is your job to do the miraculous so Lord I speak that over your people I pray that you would keep us until the next time we gather I pray that you would keep fresh faith stirred I pray that you would speak to us with greater clarity than we've ever experienced I pray that you would make your direction prominent I pray that you would meet every one of our needs according to your glorious riches I pray that you would cause us once again to experience the rewards of risk because we walk by faith and not by sight until next week if you believe that God will do it I want you to put your hands together and give God the best shout of praise that you can magnify the Lord with me let us exalt his name Hallelujah. together